Hey Dave, got a few uh, more people just uh, logging in. It's going good. What about you? A uh, beautiful sunny day here in San Francisco. It's uh, Perfect. hard hard to believe there's a pandemic going on when it's 65 well, and blue skies. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So good windows in your bunker, good visibility of the outside world. Yeah, I mean, sorry, I'm in a bunker underground right now. <laughs> uh, it's it's uh, what I call the California version of a bunker. Uh, yeah. Is, you know, it's short sleeves and uh, in sunshine. a bungalow than a bunker. Yeah, we, yeah. we call that California yeah. bunkers, so. Yeah, uh, so we have to... We have to figure some music to um, to lead us in into this show for, for the future. So one of the things we should run as a competition is come up with the tune. So, right. you know, cool. come up with some ideas, maybe something very California, maybe some Beach Boys. I don't know. I don't know. We could we could do it. But uh, hey, let's let's go ahead and kick us off, Phil. And yep. uh, let's, let's, let's go get in. started. Yeah. yeah. OK, it is Thursday at 3.30 p.m. in San Francisco, 6.30 p.m. in New York and 8.30 a.m. on Friday morning here in Melbourne, Australia. Welcome to episode six of the Supply Chain Bunker. Where did those six weeks go? Um, so as the COVID crisis disrupts the world of manufacturing and supply chain, it challenges our perception of globalization. Governments around the world are acting to reduce supply chain dependence on China with a bill in Congress here in the US and Japan pro providing billions of dollars of uh, incentives to move supply chains. One of the things we wanna talk about today is what does that mean for manufacturing in the US what would a, and what would a post COVID new world order look like? Mm -hmm. In the bunker this week, we've got two great guests from the CNC world and from the product development and prototyping world, Danny York and Greg Miner and they'll introduce themselves a little bit when we bring them on. We want to explore manufacturing in the US and the, and the amazing capacity that, it, that exists there and discuss what a more regionalized supply chain might look like. And I'm looking forward to exploring the huge breadth and depth of manufacturing expertise available in the US, but also from these two guests. Um, Please join in throughout the throughout the show. Ask questions by adding comments uh, into the Q and A box or the chat box windows on your screens right now. Um, but before we get started, I just wanted to hit a few headlines that caught my eye this week. Um, as I mentioned, we're seeing more and more government intervention in supply chains and manufacturing. And this Monday, we had a tweet from Donald Trump. Um, talking about passing an executive order to suspend immigration to the US to pr protect US jobs in the midst of the coronavirus. And I think we're seeing that around the world. People are starting to amp up those, um, those government initiatives and starting to think about what the supply chain might look like uh, post this crisis. We're seeing more and more robot applications, both in the workplace and in the front line with stories like robots helping get food on shelves in the crisis and drones and AGVs being repurposed to disinfect and surveil public areas. And even the doctor spot robot is seeing COVID patients. So, you know, using that, that, I, that iPad style of interface direct with, uh, with patient care. One of the other headlines that caught my eye was in Industry Week this week, um, technology takes center stage as manufacturers pivot. And that's that pivot word again that we're hearing time and time again. And there are numerous great examples of, of companies helping out from retail brands like Zara and Amani um, making surgical gowns to Ford and G making ventilators. Um, according to a recent survey, close to 50% of businesses are using robotics or automation to help frontline, frontline workers either pivot to produce new products or to cope with the production challenges associated with the crisis. Meanwhile, on the, on the not so cheery side, the Department of Labor um, Bureau of Labor Statistics has put out yet more statistics, nearly four and a half million uh, people filed for unemployment insurance during last week, which was down from the previous week. Um, but it still means that 26 million people have filed for benefits since the coronavirus began closing businesses. And that's, you know, that's one of the real tragedies and it's how those businesses get back online yeah. post the crisis that is, a, that is a big concern. So there are, 
pockets where technology and innovation and manufacturing are, are really pushing things forward. But there's, you know, there's always sobering news out there, Dave. It's, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still a very tough, very challenging time. Yeah, I, I think from our side, I, I couldn't agree more. I'm definitely a glass is half full kind of guy. And I think uh, amidst any type of downturn like this, there's so much opportunity uh, that happens as a result. I think about how if there's 24 million people that's lost their job, how can we reshape the economy with mm. 24 million people? And what, is that, what does that actually mean? Um, there's a huge amount of potential here. I was catching up with another, another founder uh, yesterday, um, and she runs a group called Daughters for Rosie. And it's this organization that's actually all around helping drive women into manufacturing to help close the gap. Uh, mm -hmm. on gender inside of manufacturing specific roles. Um, and she was telling me a lot uh, around this idea of the opportunity that's created by having so many folks looking for new jobs and how you can shift a lot of those. Um, and I think having uh, that brightness in our day is, is always important. Yeah. Um, we've had other moments like that. I, I would say, you know, the manufacturing industry in the US has really looked to PPEs for our, our healthcare. Uh, workers to help drive this. You know, we, when we set up our strategy for that, it was both overseas as well as domestic uh, injection yeah. molding that we were using to get these the frontline workers. And that continues here. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I'm so excited to talk about today is this idea of choice for product developers. Mm. And being in the bunker, our whole idea is to help bring the best minds and brains together uh, to talk about some of this. And I think um, when I think about product development or manufacturing, oftentimes people don't believe they have choice. They only have yeah. one relationship with someone down the street or they just say, well, it's cheap, so it has to be made in China. I think yeah. that these are all misconceptions. Um, yeah. The idea that it is cheaper to make in China is, is false, actually. Yeah. And I think we'll hear that from Greg Miner a lot, who's studied that both at a large enterprise as well as uh, uh, smaller companies as well. Um, and I think the other idea is the is that we don't have talent in the United States to make a lot of these products. And I think Danny can speak to the yeah. really the talent that we have uh, for boots on the ground. So I, I think I'm I'm really excited to share with everyone you know watching this and tuning in now this idea of choice um, yeah. that we want to give to people. And I think if you're going to have better choice, it breaks down to two areas. The first is you have to give better access if you want to have choice. And the second is you need better facts. Is it yeah. factual that it's cheaper here or better quality or talent? Um, and so I think we see our roles, part of this bunker is to help bring better access and, and better facts to the table to have experts talk about it. Uh, really yeah. what's going on in the world of product development in the US uh, and how can we help uh, shift and change some of this with everything that's going on? Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. And I think that, um... Part of that, what you say about the choice and 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 the understanding is that visibility and the the ability to actually know what stuff costs. So that all those hidden costs that are in the manufacturing process, and I know both of our guests can talk to that today. Yeah. Um, but also understanding how to co calculate total cost of ownership. I think that that misses a lot of people. And you've got to look at cost, not price, when you're buying when you're buying a part because that that's that's the big picture. Hey, let's not waste any time. Let's get um, one of our guests on. Let's get um, Danny York on. Danny York is the manufacturing manager from York Precision. Um, and he manages that business that was started by his father. He manages that business with his brother, Brian. Um, Danny, come join us in the bunker and give us a little bit of a two minute introduction to Danny York and York Precision. Oh, hey guys. Uh, yeah, we run a machining shop uh, in Campbell, California. Um, we've been at it. I'm a third generation machinist. So my great grandfather was a machinist. My father was a machinist uh, all the way on down. So um, we've been working really hard to address all of the issues that have been coming up in the supply chains. Mm -hmm. And we've been making a lot of PPE equipment and, uh, I've been seeing some really inspired designs and a lot of ingenuity uh, coming forward from just our whole manufacturing community. And I've seen a lot of people who 
our competitors, but now we're working sort of all together. And instead of being competitors, it's more of a cooperative spirit. Mm. And uh, I'm just really glad that I get to be a part of it. Um, it feels really, it feels really good to feel like I'm doing something to uh, help address the crisis. And uh, every time I make a part for a ventilator or every time I make um, a PPE mask, um, it just feels like I'm making a difference. Um, yeah, we've been doing this for a really long time. And uh, yeah, you know, our whole thing is uh, cutting edge prototypes and being right on the forefront of innovation and the tight tolerance stuff. So that's where our niche yeah. is, is in the hard to make stuff. <clears throat> Danny, we're, we're all about collaboration in the bunker. And it, every time we get to the end of the bunker, what we try and do is we have a little bit of a wrap up and we, we ask people what the key takeaways, collaboration, cooperation has come up in every single episode is number one you know getting help and and talking to people in your network i know you're i know you're modest and you don't want to mention it but you've got a um a project you're doing with masks that results in some free masks going to some very important places tell us very briefly about that sure um so i was contacted by local uh, chonc children's hospital they deal with um respiratory disease and they were looking for a way to source PPE because all of those supply chains that everybody thought were rock solid from China actually turned out to be really, really brittle. Um, mm -hmm. So they've been looking to, you know, the, everyone's been scrambling to figure out their new supply chain. Um, so when they reached out to me, I, I, I just didn't feel right about charging sick kids for PPE equipment. <laughs> So uh, I'm donating all the masks, uh, or all of us, it's not just me, it's, we're, we, we decided as a team to donate all the masks to the kids. So um, we make these really cool carbon fiber masks that look very not copyright infringement Darth vader -y. I got this uh, got the model online, <laughs> but it looks like this. Um, we sell them for 150 each, and each one gets a spool of filament for our, um, our polycarbonate printer and makes uh, about 23 masks for a doctor. So if you're looking to get a, uh, a high-end luxury <laughs> PPE mask that looks cool, oh, yeah. uh, give me contact and I'll make you one. That's well, post-COVID, everybody in the Valley is going to be wearing those. That's, That's going to awesome. be the new fashion accessory. Danny, one of the things that I've loved is that, you know, you, you said that you're, you're a third, third generation machinist. And I, I think that there's this misconception in the U.S. that the talent is really like moved away from the U.S. of producing. Could you maybe just talk a little bit around mm -hmm. your journey of how, how did you learn your craft and, and how, uh, what, what was that like uh, growing up with? Uh, it sounds like cutting chips was in your blood, essentially. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Uh, I always joke that uh, I used to measure my GI Joes with calipers. Um, <laughs> growing up, my dad worked for uh, several different companies in the Bay Area. Um, back then in the, the early 90s, the, um, they didn't treat workers as well as they do today. So he ended up moving around to a lot of different shops. He got really tired of that. Mm -hmm. um, so he ended up starting his own shop in the garage and then he realized he was losing money going to work and that's kind of how he got started uh i remember i was out there like five years old sweeping the floor and i've been at it ever since um i went and got my master's uh from csc monterey bay and i've been a because my dad's one hell of a machinist but you know somebody's needed to learn the business end of things so that's kind of where i've come in that's awesome and how how is um has it, it must have changed a lot from measuring your GI Joes and sweeping the floor to, you know, you run a pretty high end sophisticated shop now with both additive equipment as well as, you know, subtractive. How, how is that, how has that changed over the years? You know, just the, the, the technology side. Right. So when my dad started out, everything was um, between manual and CNC machining. And if you're going to have a guy on a lathe all day, that's a very labor intensive process to just have one man manually machining all day. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's where a lot of China's competitive advantage comes in. Is they can just throw people at a problem. You know, um, uh, when I did my master's thesis, so my, my numbers are a little dated. Um, I think it was something like you can hire 18 Chinese machinists for every one American machinist if you compare the wages. But now with automation, I can have one guy manning a robot arm and have that robot arm manning four CNC lathes. Wow. So 
the competitive advantage from China, um, it's slowly being minimized. And eventually I think that they'll normalize it because there's just, no matter how many people you throw on a manual lathe, the price of those robot arms is getting cheaper. They used to be a hundred thousand, yeah. now they're 60 and some of them are even 30. Wow. Yeah, I think that robotics and automation is going to play a huge role in kind of a little bit of leveling the playing field and taking labor out. What I was also interested in with that, Danny, is when you talk about that, is that what's helping you with your ability to operate now with social distancing and, um, you know, creating a work environment that's safe for all your staff, yet you're still able to produce the, 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 the products that you need to produce? Right. The automation is a big part of it, but more than the automation, it's just been about being smart. Uh, it's about staggering shifts. Um, we don't have everyone break for lunch now. Instead, we have food brought in, little things like that, you know, making sure that everyone washes their hands, uses gloves. You know, if everyone's smart and everyone works together, there's no reason you can't operate a perfectly successful shop while keeping people six feet apart. Uh, also, like our lead programmer, he works from home and emails the programs in. With modern machines that have Wi-Fi connectivity, there's no reason that you can't do everything over the cloud. Well, not over the cloud for our ITAR stuff, but there's no reason you can't make everything work. Um, mm. if, it, if this pandemic had happened in the 90s, it would have been a big problem. But most CNC machines now can connect to the internet or connect to your closed network, and there's no reason you can't make everything work. Our CNC operators go to the machine, the program's already loaded in the machine ready to go. They've already got their printed out set of sheet and they can organize everything from there. Has that had yeah. to shift a lot for you, Danny? I mean, it sounds like a pretty technical operation, you know, that I think folks still think of machine shops in a lot of ways as, you know, it's just grease and, uh, and uh, you know, and you're, you're manually running bridge ports maybe, but you're talking about, you know, high-speed internet, Wi-Fi connected machines, you have a machinist, you know, that's running programs from at home. That sounds like you, you guys have had to adapt a lot in the, the last couple of years, I would imagine. Yeah, um, I believe the figure is something like um, it used to be uh, one out of every 10 machinists had uh, a y-axis lathe. Now it's something like five out of every machinist has a, a mm -hmm. y-axis lathe and there's more fifth axis machining and, and mm -hmm parts are becoming more ergonomic and more complex as time goes on, you know, systems evolve. Yeah. Uh, getting away with just having manual machinists doesn't cut it anymore. And there has been some of a learning curve, but for me, I kind of grew up as the technology matured. Uh, we, we, <laughs> I call myself the Oregon Trail generation because <laughs> I, we didn't have really good video games when I was a kid, uh -huh. but we did have Oregon Trail. So. Yeah. Every time a new piece of technology comes out, it's really important to adapt and keep current. Because um, if you don't, you're gonna end up getting left behind. Uh, old, uh, so for instance, my father, he had to choose between whether he was going to spend the day doing paperwork or spend the day being attached to his bridge port all day. Mm -hmm. Now me, I can keep five machines running uh, if it's a nice good 100 part run and I can be doing multiple operations on multiple machines and still getting work done in the back end of the shop. And that's just with me here. That's, that's if all my guys are busy or out on errands or, you know, Dan sign up material or what have you. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that the automation necessarily hurts the number of jobs. It mm -hmm. just frees me up to do the other things in the company. The more creative yeah. or, or the ability to uh, do things that maybe uh, you, you can multiply your, your impact is what it sounds like. Yeah, more added value. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Danny, what, what, one of the things I'm really curious about is over the last two months, what have you seen in change of your work mix of stuff has come in? Have you seen people when initially we had the disruption in China, were you seeing jobs being urgently shifted back? And what have you seen in the last month in terms of, this, of disruption and change? Right. So we've been running pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week, um, just to keep up with all the demand. A lot of my customers that used me for their quick turn prototyping or their kind of emergency work or just their prototyping that they would then ship to China, those customers are coming here with all their work and they are staying so far. Um, I think a lot of people realized that the, the advantage they were getting from the 
the cheap money, the you're the I guess what would be a better way, a more tactful way of putting it. They're they're saving costs in the short term while ignoring the long term benefits of a close relationship. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um Whenever you talk about manufacturing, it's always synonymous with relationships. Uh, you, you have to have boots on the ground wherever you're manufacturing. Uh, that's actually one of the, the strong things about Fictive. They have people in China, boots on the ground in China, and that's part of why they're able to trust the work that they get done from there. Whereas being a machinist, I'd say every almost without fail, every time someone comes through my door and they've gotten manufacturing done overseas, they've had a negative experience where IP was stolen or promises weren't delivered on. Or uh, my, my favorite example was um, one guy had a test tube heating fixture that had a metal spatula baked into the recycled aluminum that the person had used and it had a fake certification with the material. Oh you know, these yeah. things happen. Um, but when your manufacturing partner is around the corner or around the block or in the same town as you, you can go check on your parts physically. You can shake people's hands. I can give people real-time updates. If there's a problem with a part, I can drive down to a facility and take the part back and fix it and get it back out there. Mm -hmm. um, just having a localized supply chain gives you a lot of advantages yeah. that aren't just necessarily based on the price point yeah. that you just can't match with needing to ship stuff back and forth to China. I think we've yeah, all that... believed the, the same thing here, Danny, and, and that the idea like you said, with automation, that it gives you leverage to run five machines at once versus just run the lathe. You know, we really think from fictive standpoint, how do you build relationships with these, you know, manufacturing partners to know what you're really good at uh, to hopefully help you expand. And uh, I think that I couldn't agree more from a relationship standpoint. It's all, it's all around building the rapport and then, you know, get, continuing to, to drive more automation of the stuff you don't want to do or, or that you could could have multiple arms doing at one time. Yeah. And I think um, that story about proximity is really important. You know, whether it's proximity to design, whether it's proximity to the brand itself, whether it's proximity to the customer that you're shipping to or to the final consumer, that's really important. And I think that's a really good point to bring Greg in uh, because that's one of his areas of expertise. So let's bring in Greg Miner. Greg Miner describes himself as a maker, breaker, and innovator, which I'm fascinated by. He's an expert in product development, prototyping, and a manufacturing specialist. Greg, come join us and give us just a quick two-minute introduction on your background. Yeah, uh, I started here in the Bay Area about 25 years ago, model maker, machinist, um, started out basically manual, a lot like what Danny was talking about, manual mills, bridge ports, lathes, hardings, lathes, and we were working a lot in foam and wrench shape and stuff like that. And I graduated kind of into the process and looking at like how we refine the processes and do those things. And over my career, I've kind of, kind of developed that into prototyping, product development, and then manufacturing. I've worked for, you know, um, North Face, Bell Helmets, Apple Computers, um, just finished a stint with uh, Facebook Oculus. I've also worked in the soft good industry and kind of like analyzed how they do things. But I think, you know, some of the things that we're talking about today and, and Danny kind of really hit the, the, the nail on the head is relationships and, and, and developing those relationships. Uh, I've got 25 years experience working with a bunch of different companies in a bunch of different categories and, and really understanding how we can utilize and use best practices in that. Um, and I think, you know, um, one of the things um, we talked about was how do you know what you're getting when you go to an offshore, you know, manufacturer? And, yeah. and that's always a, 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 a kind of hit and miss kind of thing. Even when I was at Facebook and managed a 35 member team, um, we would go over there and sometimes they would say the tool would be ready, but it wasn't. And so we'd spend two or three days there literally debugging this tool. And we had eight to 10 members on the ground and that was terribly expensive to kind of debug that right in the process. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so yeah, so um, my, my background is really product development and prototyping, yeah. but I've, I've leveraged that in the manufacturing side of really kind of like, what is the best practices we're trying to do and help the companies that I work with to kind of be more efficient and get the best product to market. I love it, Craig, and thanks so much for, for joining and, and everything. Uh, we've known each other for a long time now and share a bunch of passions for uh, breaking things and, and making things, I would say. 
Um, you know, I'd, I'd love to know for, from you, you know, you've seen this product development arc just happen for, you know, uh, 25 years. H how has it changed? Do you think that things will really change after the, the pandemic here for, for US or do you think uh, it's more of the same? No, most definitely. I think, and I've seen a lot of that because I left Facebook uh, in early January and mm -hmm. I've seen, and a lot of people have been contacting me as how do we get manufacturing here in the United States? And um, one of the things that I would do with my teams when I was at Facebook or North Face or even Apple is, is I'd analyze what it would actually cost us to do a tool or build a product in, in China or Taiwan or one of those offshore manufacturers. And it was very expensive. And I don't think larger companies see that at the bottom line because they're not really paying attention. I'm actually quite excited. Uh, a lot of companies are looking at like the supply chain and how they could do that and move that back to the United States. Yeah. And I've talked to numerous people in the industry, both hardware and soft goods, and even, you know, startups of like, we can't be held, you know, kind of responsible or can't held captive uh, if something goes down in an offshore clientele. And so we've got to build out a robust system. I think a lot of companies, especially some of the top tier companies are going to be looking at U.S. manufacturing. And can you help break down for me? Because I, I love I love this idea that, you know, you've helped executives at these big companies, you know, like a Facebook and North Face to, to look at the cost difference between the two. Like, how, how do you how do you even start to approach a problem like that? So one of the interesting things that when I joined Facebook is they didn't have a prototyping really development process and everything. And so we had a product that we were going to launch one of the um, ARVR products and everything. And we had a tool designed and I took a team of about eight to 10 members to China and I really want to document what that cost. Hmm. We stayed in very nice hotels. We were there for about 12 days yeah. and with the air fares and everything, it was close to about $200,000. Wow. A quarter million. And that was not just, that wasn't the tooling cost. That wasn't what we were paying the supplier. That wasn't the things that we we're doing. Yeah. And we did that four or five times a year. Mm -hmm. And if you kind of analyze that and look at that and say, what would it take to set that up and do that in the United States? I think that it's a lot cheaper than a million dollars a year. But also, I think that, again, back to the relationship, I could jump on a plane and go to the Midwest or I could go to Southern California or I could I could even drive down to Southern uh, uh, San Jose and look at something and I automatically identify a problem with a tool. Mm -hmm. um, that I don't have to fly 14 hours or 18 hours to get to. So mm -hmm. I think companies going forward are going to start really looking at that and leveraging that to um, what they can both be not only efficient, but also quicker turnarounds and better iterations for a better product. Oh. So Greg, is that is that like an accounting error? Do people just not consider those hidden costs? And you know, is, is, uh, there, is there a dynamic in selecting geographies, which is, which is changing when people do do that? I, 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 would, I would love to understand the thinking behind that because <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the you know, million dollar question, I guess, is, is everybody looks at price per part. Yeah. And, and when you look at the price per part, it's 30 cents a part. But they yeah. don't amortize a lot of what the cost goes into that. So they're not really doing a true justification of what that costs. Mm -hmm. And I think when you analyze that, and that was kind of my own personal thing is that I would look at like the total cost of all of these and I was like wow this is crazy that I mean I could buy a brand new Micron or a Hermley for what we're spending in developing that stuff and yeah. and literally do these amazing molds and everything in-house yeah. and um, once people started to understand the cost there's a shift but you have to really make it really transparent and you have to kind of ultimately hold people responsible for what they're spending. Danny, do you, yeah. do you see people coming to you with that same kind of like argument or are your customers coming to you saying that it's just too expensive or is that your view as well? Up until about a year and a half well, ago, everybody thought that it was cheaper to go to China. I started seeing a shift even before the pandemic uh -huh. of literally, and Dave, you, you and I, I've talked about this quite a bit. There's been this shift in where people are actually looking at what it costs for a part mm -hmm. and not, it's not just the part that comes off the injection mold. But it's like, what is the labor to design it? What is the label to do the iterations? What is the molds going to cost you? Are you going to get them made in China? Or are they going to have to be, you know, modified five or six times? What is the cost for the materials? And then what is the rejection rate that you're getting with? You know, and sometimes it's 30 or 40% rejection rates until you get that dialed in. And if you amortize that and put that all into kind of a package, that's 
U.S. is pretty competitive. If you think about it, it's yeah. actually pretty competitive once you get the system built out and set up. And there's a whole yeah. dynamics behind, behind doing that because you've got a workflow and you've got to yeah. have a material process. You've got to have all these kind of things in line to do that. But once you do that, it's pretty amazing that the, the cost is, is very similar. Yeah. yeah, you've got to move from price to customer value. Dan, Danny, do you do you have that debate with your customers? Are your customers asking you, okay, well, this is the price, but do they understand that calculation of total cost of ownership? Right. Most of my customers understand that either out of the gate or they come to understand it over time. Um, so one of my customers, I make part of a, a an assembly or several parts to an assembly actually, and one of the components of their assembly is uh, a plastic injection molded piece of plastic. And every time he gets a shipment, the shipment is different. And every time he has to end up flying to China to get it sorted out. Yeah. And it got so bad to the point where he finally now has a, a provider down in San Diego. He went to China and basically, he didn't steal, but he um, he acquired his molds back from the Chinese manufacturer and is yeah. now using those molds in San Diego and he's getting better results. And now when there's a problem, he only has to go to San Diego or pick up a phone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So most of my customers, I, like Greg had mentioned, that, that 30 to 40% rejection rate, that's not atypical. That's uh, how I acquired my second biggest customer was they had gotten a bunch of parts made in China and only one third of them worked. And then the company was unwilling to try and make it again because it was a high difficulty part. We're talking a 1,000th tolerance part on a 20,000th long pin, you know, micro machine. Yeah. So most of my customers, um, well, not most, but I'd say most of the ones who have gone overseas, because um, they're coming to me, they probably had a bad experience. Um, but I can say from the number of customers that I have and the steady workflow that it's, there's not, it's not atypical to have a nightmare with your overseas machine. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll use that to maybe grab a, a question from the audience and, and Greg, I'll let you take this first one. Um, and so thanks, thanks for putting questions in folks. Uh, this said, isn't a major driver for Asia based manufacturing, the capability to, to uh, ramp it fast and do high volume. So the question is, at what unit volumes, either monthly or annually, do you think onshore makes sense, Greg? Like, are, are the, is there a sweet spot that you see onshore versus offshore? In terms yeah, of that's a really good question. And I think actually, um, Danny and you guys talked a little bit about that, is, is that we're becoming more and more um, relevant to robotics and automation. And that's becoming less and less as far as like the high volumes and stuff you do when you replace a human or replace something that can run 24 seven a day mm -hmm. and really increase that productivity and that high volume you're talking about. So I've seen that actually decrease. The <laughs> ramping, the ramping is subjective. I, in my opinion, the ramping is, well, if you get the tool right the first time, which I have very rarely seen, unless I actually hand walk it and do everything in the process through it. But that fast ramp, even in the best processes, even in the companies that I worked out with Jable and PCH and Apple, they have problems when they're ramping to get to that 100,000 units and whatever 200,000 units they need. Yeah. They have problems where that delays. And so mm -hmm. that's not really brought into the equation when they say, oh, I can have it ready in 60 days. Mm -hmm. Generally, it's probably double that from mm -hmm. my appearance. Mm -hmm. and, and so you're not talking about real world numbers when they talk about that kind of stuff. If, if you really did an amortization of all of the tooling that you did and what it took to do that, I would guess that most of those manufacturers were late. Mm -hmm. Very seldom did they actually hit their deadlines. And do you think there's a point though where the U.S. would be more advantageous to do that ramp uh, versus say Asia where a lot of- Oh yeah, yeah. We, and you have, I've talked about this is where I think we call it bridge manufacturing and, and, and literally, I think the 100,000 is the sweet spot is where you can get it ramped out, test out the tool in the US, get it done. And then if you have to do either five or six tools or a larger tool, then you can actually convert that over in China or Asia or something like that where you need the higher volumes. But I think, you know, generally 100,000 units or something like that. And plus if something goes wrong, you can fly to the Midwest, or you can fly to Southern California, you can yeah. fly to one of these places in a couple of hours. It doesn't, and it doesn't take a team. Three people can go there and really debug this tool and get it done. I love that. So that's your sweet spot. You're saying, hey, if you're in the under 100K, which 
so many products are under oh, the yeah. Yeah, of course. you know that you should be looking seriously at the us and and look at southern california texas midwest uh all over the place yeah i think yeah. the other part of that is complexity dave and and you know i was kidding. this is again one of the questions that that has come in when we're talking about parts obviously there's a number there but then when we get to unit assembly, there is, there's a whole different amount of complexity in there. Does the number change? And I'm assuming that 100,000 number is, is bigger than it used to be five years ago. Yeah, assembly is quite interesting. That's, a, that's an interesting dynamic because when, when we were doing stuff at Facebook Oculus, we would do probably 500, 1,000, 2,000, just to kind of test everything and make sure they were right. Mm. And then everything was assembled because again, the labor is cheaper and they have things, but there was a delay in that process. We would actually have to build our own fixtures for mm. them to assemble them. And, mm. and we would go over there and show them how these fixtures work mm. on the assembly line, not, not the manufacturing or the molding, literally the assembly and, and then that stuff. And that again, was a delay in the process and, and people don't adequate that. And so, um, yes, I think that to Dave's point is, is that maybe in the future where you have this you know, 12 million people, a new labor force and everything, retraining mm -hmm. people at, at a reasonable rate to do 50, 100,000 units US could be cost effective. I really do think that you could find that sweet spot to where you can make it very profitable. Anything over that, I do think that unfortunately, you know, Asian and, and, and the um, Far East markets do have us kind of beat on that context. And Danny, is that something you'd be interested in? Like, if you imagine trying to do this, like, 10,000, you know, maybe 20,000 from an assembly and, and training people. Is that something you think your shop could handle and that you might shift your business from just making parts to doing some assembly? We've done things like that for a, a night vision scope company uh, yeah. springs to mind where we've helped them set up their own manufacturing facility. So we've done consulting and we've done that type of thing before. Cool. Um, also with some of my other customers who I've, I do production run several times a year for, um, they always come to me with things like, you know, uh, we're really worried that if we ship our stuff over to China, that maybe President Trump will hike a tariff up tomorrow because it's so yeah. unpredictable. Or, you know, um, I have some people who are also, uh, depending on where they fall on the spectrum politically, they, they view China as a, um, as a strategic opponent and they don't necessarily want to put their products over there and strengthen their manufacturing. So I run into really all spectrums and types of people with all manner of reasons to not want to get things made. Um, yeah, I'd say in a perfect world that there would be um, like a supply chain diversity where China handles the super thin margin of high volume work like paper clips or, or you know, the easy to make things where, you know, products are more on the disposable end, whereas more regional stuff might be your harder to make components and your more high end components. And that's where I tend to find a good niche for my company is making the aerospace parts, the medical parts, the military parts, um, and medical parts. Yeah, it's really interesting what you say there, Danny. There's all kinds of elements that are coming into that decision. Some are political, some are emotional, some are some are financial. What I'm curious about is who are the personas that are making those decisions? And for both Danny and Greg, are other people that are coming to you engineers? Are they prototype guys? Are they supply chain managers? Um, and Greg, from your point of view, when you're doing that from a, um, an outbound point of view, when do you involve the supply chain manager? And, and you know, what team do you put together to, to make those decisions? You want to start, Greg? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think, you know, like we talked about is, is that one of, one of the things we worked on, on on small builds, anything under 500 or something like that is, is that we just didn't have the resources to do that um, mm -hmm. in the 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And yeah. when you get into the 50,000, 100,000, it really isn't cost effective for somebody that's getting paid $40 an hour or, you know, something like that. Um, but there is something to the point of like um, China and some of the other manufacturers are very technical and they understand exactly how to do that. Whereas our labor force, you have to retrain them to do that. And, and there is kind of that learning curve and those things that you have to kind of add into the tech. That said, I think that there's an opportunity going forward in this new kind of like process that we could easily shift that 
to the sub 100,000 units and do it just as cost effective and, and, and have a, a robust um, process in place if we just had the right processes behind it. Um, Danny mentioned that you know, there's a lot of different components that go into that. You've got to really analyze what you're good at and what you're not good at. And, mm -hmm. and if you can do that, um, circuit boards, you know, some stuff like that, that I won't touch it because the, the technology and stuff that we can do, I can actually get it cheaper literally in Canada or Mexico. And, and it's a lot yeah. easier for things like that to be done. And sub assemblies, you can actually get sub assemblies done on a quicker and, and probably a, a cheaper revenue. But that being said, what happens if you change that in the design process halfway through that, that, that process, mm -hmm. you have to basically scrap it and start over. Um, and yeah. Argue, is that argument, Greg, like, are you bringing that to a supply chain manager? Like at what point are you bringing that in versus I imagine Danny, you deal with a lot of engineers more so than supply chain folks. Yeah, I think yeah, most of the people I deal with are engineers um, or people who have an idea that they're trying to bring to market. Uh, I would deal with a lot of startups, um, but I'd say engineers and people involved in, in the manufacturing of products and design of products. Because for us, we do a lot of engineering and design work too to help people um, head off a lot of those unforeseen costs by making bad products. Yeah. Uh, my brother is, is just like the programming wizard of, of the Bay. So when it comes to doing that design and engineering work and collaborating with our customers to cut costs, that's kind of like our niche. Um, and you don't get that with uh, a lot of, well, with a lot of manufacturers in general, but specifically with a lot of the ones in China, it's kind of like you send them a print and they send you your parts. So that communication and that collaboration is, is dipping in worth a lot and very valuable. And how about for you, yeah. Greg, in larger, kind of organizations, you know, the, the, the North Face, Apples, Facebooks, like, uh, when are you bringing in the global supply chain managers to talk around this, like, this cost element that you, you've talked so much about? So the great thing is, is that most larger corporations, stuff like that, they run everything in parallel. So when, even when we're doing prototyping, literally first phase, zero phase, proof of concept and stuff like that, generally have a manufacturing technician or a manufacturing manager in the conversation saying you know in three months when we lock design or lock you know the production model that we're going to go with we're going to be talking about this all the way through that process i think some of the, the the catches in that is is that we get to the end result and and there's there's a change that basically radically changes the way the product is actually functioning and when that happens it's almost a reset and mm -hmm. and, and you've lost a lot of time in doing that but I do think that to answer your question, Dave, is, is that working in parallel and helping them understand that we're on that path and, and them being in the conversation at the very beginning is, is critical. Um, just knowing that we can only do a limited amount of you know, those kind of builds and what we can do and knowing that they're gonna have a huge volume when, once it starts production. It sounds like a yeah, key stakeholder is. for you that you're you're saying that it's two parallel paths like this and that your engineering, they're working with Danny back and forth, making all these changes, but you need to make sure that those supply chain managers are seeing cost elements and, and how you can, can adjust here. Yeah, yeah. One of the exciting things that I kind of like in the parallel program is you can actually cut a tool in that time frame and get real world material to test out the design. We used to just kind of like try and machine it or something close to it, mm -hmm. but now we're getting so sophisticated and so good at it. You can either mm -hmm. five axe machine it, or you can actually cut a tool in, in, in a week and, and have real world materials to test it out. And if, if you could bring that state side and actually have that two or three extra iterations before you actually go into the 200, 300, 400,000 units, man, that would just be a game changer. It would seriously, it's like so many times I've been in meetings where they're getting to the end of it and they're like, have we tested this out in polypropylene? Have we tested this out in, you know, Glassfield Nylon? Have we tested this out in the real world material? And they're like, no, we haven't. We've got the best that we can do. We can machine or we can 3D print or we can, you know, do something that halfway gets us there until yeah. you actually have real world materials. It's kind of a hit or miss. Yeah. I do. One of the things that, it, that it, as I listen to you, you both, I, I hear this discussion about this polarized idea of kind of made in China and made in the USA. And I wonder if post COVID there's, there's, there's an alternative. And I wanted to ask you both what your kind of utopian model is, but is it something that's more regionalized and is it something that's 
maybe just a little bit more thoughtful in terms of, of, of where stuff goes. Um, Danny, maybe I can start with you. You don't want the $4 trillion worth of business that's being manufactured in China because it doesn't all suit you. What do you, what do you see as an ideal scenario? Right. So I keep hearing this buzzword thrown around by my customers. Uh, they call it supply chain diversity. So ideally, my customers would come to me with the parts that make sense for our shop and, and the way our shop is set up. Those are the parts that are, you know, sub hundred thousand dollar parts and some hundred, uh, sub hundred thousand unit uh, parts and assemblies, that kind of part. Is anything over that? you really start getting into that kind of labor intensive work where you need a lot of people and a, a whole bunch of people working together in concert. And that's probably um, where I see that the, the Chinese manufacturers really come together is when it's 100,000 and up parts. Um, but that leaves a lot of room for people who are currently getting their things made in China and could be getting them made here. Um, like we had discussed earlier, when someone looks at a breakdown of their costs, they see travel as a separate line item from mm. their manufacturing costs when actually those two things are, should be interwoven. Um, there's a lot of hidden costs that people don't see when they, they do that kind of uh, overseas manufacturing. Um, I yeah. suppose ideally we would be doing the, the tighter tolerance part, mm -hmm. uh, even though they're a lot more work. Um, and we would be doing the parts that for whatever reason they don't want to send to China, like, um, they don't necessarily want to have the people in uh, China over there know their proprietary designs or their yeah. special sauce. Yeah, it feels like it feels like those are the highest value add as well. You know, that's that's the business you want. That's where that's where the margins are less less wafer thin as well. Yeah. How, how about Greg, you? What's, uh, how about I've always trust to be a big part of uh, of yeah. any manufacturing relationship and. Yeah when it comes to people who are regionally located to you, I've, I've always found that trust to be a lot easier to strike up. Yeah. 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 And how about for you, Greg, like what's the, what is the ideal magic wand post COVID kind of mix look like? Well, it's interesting because uh, like we discussed the last couple of days is, is I see that there's going to be a dynamic shift in the way that people actually look at um, manufacturing and to Danny's point is I think there is that diversity of like what are we going to start channeling US and what is that number going to look like I use you know a hundred thousand units but it it may grow to that if we build out a supply chain that can actually be as robust as some of those other people that they need it and if if we can get the turnaround times and the complexity and the cost to generally stay within that parameters. I'm very excited. In fact, I've talked to several companies in the last 30 days mm -hmm. about how they start that discussion and what does that process look like? So I think there's gonna be a dynamic shift in the way people kind of look at things. Mm -hmm. And I really like the way that Danny kind of phrased the diversity in manufacturing is, is what is that sweet spot that the US is looking at? Mm -hmm. um, and then what do we shift it to? Knowing that we're you know, gonna build out the, the US base to a certain quality or quantity, and then, and then it's going to shift over to a larger quantity, you know, offshore. Tell me about that, Greg. What do you think the infrastructure is needed to do that? Like, what is it across technology or skill sets? Or like, what are the things you think we need to make that reality actually happen? I, I, again, this is where, I, I, and I'm not plugging fictive, but I think this is, uh, this is where you have a partner that understands all of those dynamics that you need to get a part made. Mm -hmm. And it's not just engineering, it's not just design, and it's not just an injection molder or a tool designer or some, you know, caveat to that whole process is understanding the process. Like we talked about, a lot of supply chains are having trouble getting material now. And, and, and when you can't get material, it doesn't matter how fast or how cheap you can do it, you're just not going to be able to do it. And, and I think understanding that complete package and the way that we move forward in a U.S.-based thing is we have DuPont, we have ATAR and a bunch of different suppliers in the US that they're literally, you know, 12 hours away. So that supply chain can be very unique in the situation that we actually build a process for that yep. 100,000 units, knowing yep. that we're going to shift if we're going to go over that. It's really the process that's going to happen. And that means, you know, injection molding and teaching people how to really do that and fine tune it. 
um, tool designers. That's, that's a lost art in, in my world is really good tool designers. Mm -hmm. And then, and then again, really good partnerships with like Danny and his team and machinists that can get this stuff done in a reasonable time for a reasonable cost and then have quick iteration so that if we do need to change it, we can. So it sounds like it's less around the materials or the specific processes. You really think it's kind of volume based and that if we can build yeah. like the same type of infrastructure here, that it's, it's okay then. Yeah. 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 Cause I think more and more companies are going to start. I, with, I think they're going to be a little bit gun shy about offshore versus us based, yeah. which mm -hmm. is a good thing. And mm -hmm. I think that really is that we, we've been chiming on this for five or 10 years, Dave, you and I have been like, let's look at like us based manufacturing. And now it's really kind of like, okay, what is the real cost of a part, real yeah. cost, real world cost, versus if we build out something or look for something US based? Danny, I was curious what Greg was saying about the skills that are out there. What are you seeing in terms of um, skills right. and skill shortages? Do you see that as a, as a break to your, um, to your success? And I to definitely your to grow? see there being, yeah, I definitely see there being skill shortages. It's hard, good help is hard to find, um, for sure. But I think the key to bringing more manufacturing back to uh, the States isn't necessarily in training up uh, a whole legion of, of people to pass the baton to as much as it's creating a different manufacturing environment, mostly utilizing uh, automation. So for every, um, programmer that I hire, I also hire maybe one or two set of machinists and then a job will come in and I'll figure out how much I can automate that, whether it's through fixturing or whether it's through a robot arm. Uh, usually it's fixturing and using the CNC table itself to move parts around within the machine. Um, but being more like dynamic and agile and being able to set up a production run real quick get it on the machines, get it burst through, and then get back to your next job. I'd say that that's probably more valuable um, stateside than um, trying to throw people at it. Because again, when it comes to throwing people at a problem, that's where China usually excels. Yeah. Um, yeah. In our business, I yeah. definitely see um, the value to be had with the lean manufacturing and mm -hmm. having it be yeah. You need more people, but you don't need to try and build another China here. That's a bad idea. Yeah. Building yeah. Uh, a different style of manufacturing here is is the advantage, like with four lathes and one robot arm between them and then have a guy manning five of those stations. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's building that digital ecosystem. And, you know, I kind of look at it in three stages. I look, okay, there's a dynamic that's going to mean people are going to want to manufacture less in China. Then the, then the question that follows that immediately to me is, are people going to be prepared to pay for that? The answer is probably no, when you look at a consumer or a brand point of view. So what's the answer to that? And is that automation and digital transformation? And are the tools available for Danny to automate his processes and for Greg to automate his, um, his design and supply chain and, and that whole process. So it needs to be digital transformation of business practices as well as digital transformation in the factory. Is that what you see, Greg? And do you see tools? And you, you obviously you mentioned fictive tools, but without, without plugging fictive again, do you see um, tools available to you to do that better? Yeah, I'm actually really excited. Um, a couple of points. And I think Danny hit the nail on the head is, is that using automation and using those robotics and other things, you know, the machines that we had at um, Seattle and, and MPK for Facebook had 20 pallet changers on them. And, and that's unheard of when, when, you know, you talk about machining, uh, you know, five, 10 years ago, you know, you basically had an operator for every machine. Now a machinist or a programmer can actually, like Danny said, have a programmer that's just spending all his time programming. And then, you know, a couple of setup guys. Um, I recently visited uh, Proto Labs, and they have 200 uh, CNCs. They have five people that set it up. That's it. And they just, <laughs> wow. and they've got like an army of programmers, but we're getting smarter the way that we do things. And I think that comes with automation, robotics, and pallet changers, and more sophistication. Hmm. And I think in that, that, um, that we can actually bend that curve around um, what everybody kind of sought as labor intensive, you know, and I think that's kind of a change in the mindset. And I also want to bring out is that all the people, all my machinists, you know, that I had at, at Facebook are very well paid. 
And, and all the yeah. people I know in the Bay Area that are machinists, and Danny can speak for this, are very well paid. So it's no longer kind of in the dark that you're this kind of like grungy, you know, machinist, you know, kind of game. It's a very high top quality position to be in. And, you know, it's hard to find good talent. So when you are a good talent, you actually raise that level of, of where you're, you're working at. And so I think, and Dave can kind of testify to this too, is, is, that, is that if we kind of hone in on those processes and able to automate a little bit better than what we thought we were doing five years ago, yep. I think it's going to be a dynamic change. I love it. I love it. Yeah, and you're upping, you're upping people's skills and you're upping their value. And, and I think that's, you know, that's absolutely key. What we don't, what you don't want to shift back to the U.S. is, you know, as as Danny says, is the manufacturing of paper clips, because mm -hmm. there's no margin in that. But actually, maybe when you're designing a paper clip, or when you're designing a, a IoT based paper clip, then there's a lot more margin and a lot more opportunity in there for for U.S. manufacturing. So I think that's, you know, I think that's really um, key. It's picking the the projects, the jobs, the skills, the volumes that do suit the US and making sure they're exactly right and making sure the education systems align to provide those skills. I couldn't agree more. And so, you know, in the in the last couple of minutes here, what we what we love to do is just kind of wrap up of some of the biggest takeaways uh, that we're we're seeing kind of from this conversation. And uh, and so maybe maybe Phil, you can kick us off, and then we'll we'll go to the guests. But what what are some of the yep. things you you took away from this conversation uh, that we should think well, about for the U.S.? Yeah, well, partly in this conversation, and partly before we uh, came on camera, when you guys were talking about watches and bikes and all the cool stuff that that people are making, the craft and the skills are absolutely available in the U.S. And that's you know that's that's super impressive. The other thing that came out to me is this total cost of ownership and, and, and hidden costs, understanding the hidden costs or even the hidden value that you, are, that you get when you have a manufacturer that's, uh, that's just around the corner from you. So I think understanding that and having the tools to measure that and to show that value is really, really important. That ability to focus on what you're really good at. And that's, you know, that's exactly what Danny's business has done. By focusing on your on your what you're really good at, you get more value for that as well. So I think I think they're huge, um, and I'm not going to say any more because I, I I really love to hear what the guests have got to say. Yeah, and how about you, Greg? What what do you hope people take away uh, kind of from this conversation, or, or or that we can all learn? Well, there's a couple of things, Dave, and thanks for everybody for joining in. And everything yeah. I think number one is really understanding the cost of what it takes to actually produce a part, and I don't mm -hmm. think we've really been honest in manufacturing and people looking at that. And I've done that over my career and pointed that out. I think if you really look at that, US manufacturing makes sense for the shorter 100,000 units and stuff like that. Key other thing is, is like, you know, we've all been talking about is where's the sweet spot and what is the right project to actually do US based? And I think you've got to be really honest and transparent with that so that you can look in the mirror and go, okay, this really needs to go to China or this really is something we need to do here. And I think that's really a great token. And then Thirdly, I think probably is I'm excited for the shift or this dynamic, you know, relationship that everybody's talking about is literally, you know, where do we find these great talented pools of people and, and how do we bring them on board, educate them, train them and, and make it a lifestyle that they actually have something to be proud of. And, and I've seen that throughout my career. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, from, you know, a model maker machinist all the way up to, you know, a PD guy and stuff like that. It's amazing what the last 10 years have done for the uh for the professionalism of, you know, machinists and mold makers and all that other stuff. And I just see it going exponentially since that we've got to kind of like re we've got a reset button right here, guys. And if we yeah. do that right, it could be really, really interesting and dynamic in the next five years. That's really awesome. And how about for you, you, you Danny, what, what are some takeaways you hope people walk away with? Uh, the biggest takeaway that I would hope people would walk away with was just that when the chips were down and the supply chains broke down that the manufacturing community really uh, came up and, and covered the, covered the, yeah. uh, there's a lot of people who are out there every day who are working real hard. Like our, I, I know I am not the only shop in town going 24 seven right now. And mm -hmm. if I look tired, it's because I am. Um, but there is value to the supply chain that is not just, the price point per unit, like we said, the hidden cost. Uh, for me, that's probably my personal biggest takeaway is um, being reminded that there's a lot more that goes into the final price of the product between design and development and
travel and trust uh, right. and the unpredictability of the market with things like the COVID virus. Um, so that's probably my biggest takeaway. We're, we're lucky to have you, Danny, and, and for you to yeah. take time out from everything you're, you're doing uh, to, to help you know, with all the shortages right now. I think um, my my largest takeaways from this, and I'm gonna I'm gonna the first one would be really look at what you're world class at, um, and then say how do I do more of this? So Danny, I love this idea that you said paper clips or springs. I'm never gonna be the world class paper clip manufacturer, um, you know. And and Greg, you were talking about hey PCBAs maybe doesn't make sense, but there are things that you know are are you can be really great at, and that's a great reason to be in the U.S. I think the second one, which to quote you, Danny, and I'm going to steal this from you, but the U.S. shouldn't uh, build China here. And so we shouldn't try to copy what China's done and yeah. just put it here. We should make something that's superior. Um, and that, that's a profound statement, Danny. I, I love that idea that let's not try and build Shenzhen or, or these things. There are things that we are can be better at and superior from an infrastructure and Greg, yeah. I love all of the ways that you broke down the cost. And that's a, that's a big thing that I'm gonna, gonna take away uh, from this. Um, we're, we're at time here. So I just, yeah. oh my God, every time we get together, guys, I have so much yeah. fun, I would just say. And so a big, big, big thank you uh, for people watching. If you wanna continue this conversation, make sure to join the, the LinkedIn group that Krista posted there. Uh, we continue this thread asynchronous yeah. Um, we didn't even get to start chatting about motorcycle building, uh, yeah. magic cards, uh, and all the other fun things that I know Danny and, and Greg are passionate about. So uh, just, you know, I, everyone that's on, a, a big thank you, Greg and Danny, uh, to both of you guys. Yeah. And, uh, and Phil, as always, uh, this, is, this is fun. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Phil. Thanks. Thanks very yeah. much, guys. Thank you, everybody. Really stay safe. Thanks for having me. I really care. appreciate it. Yeah, we'll see be, you all next time in the okay. bunker. Bye. Be well and be safe. Thank you. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye.